Hey guys, my name is Trey Cooper and today we're going to be talking about constructors. So a constructor is just a way to establish an object and to initialize the variables that are in the class. So let's take a look at a constructor. This block right here is a constructor. So it has a access modifier. It doesn't have a return type because it just returns a new object. And then it has a name, which is the same as the class. So in this case, we don't take in any parameters and we set our two fields, uh, name and age to an initial value. Down here in this block, we can see how to establish a constructor. So when, when we call the constructor, this is what it looks like. We have the name of the class, the name of the uh, variable. Then we set, we assign that to a new, we use the new keyword to establish a new object. And then we call the constructor here. So that constructor is the same as this constructor. All right. So now we're going to take a look at different ways you can um, declare a constructor. So in this class, we have three constructors we have this one which is the same as the one from the last class we have this constructor that takes in a name and sets that name initial uh, value and then we have this class that takes in a name and an age and it sets those initial values here then we have a couple of getters and then we have an example down here to run through we're calling the three different um, constructors that I just showed you. So let's run this and print out the information that we put in. All right. So as we can see here, we have the three people that we just created and it has the values that we set. The first one, we didn't set anything. So it's unknown and zero, which is what the initial values in the constructor were set to. Then we have one where we pass in the name. The name has been set to Jim and we didn't pass in the age. So it's still zero. And then we have the one where we passed in John in 28. So now we have John is 28 years old. So that is how you declare a constructor and that's how you use them. So let's say we wanted to extend the functionality of this class in a subclass. We can definitely do that. And we will demonstrate that by creating this employee class, which is going to extend this person class. So it's going to get all, it's going to inherit all the, the functionality from this person class where we have a subclass named employee and we're going to add a field called job that's going to hold the job of this person. So and in our constructor, which is right here, we're going to go ahead and pass in a name and an age because that's what comes from person. We want to uh, assign those values there. And then we're going to also add this job that we want to set for this employee class. So the way we call the person constructor is by using this super constructor here in this employee class. So we pass in super and then we're going to pass in the name and the age. So this constructor call here corresponds to the constructor call in the person class that takes a name and an age, which is this constructor here. So when we pass in a name and an age, it will call the super class, which is this person class and call this constructor. All right. So back in our class, we are also setting the job, which is the field from this employee class. And then we also down here have getters. And then we have a method set up to show, to demonstrate this pretty similar to the last method in the last class. All right. So when we run this, we can see that it says John is 28 year old teacher. So now we've added on this teacher, um, which is the job field to this class. And it says the same thing that the last class. So all the functionality from the last class and we added it on through um, the use of constructors. So let's say we wanted to extend this again to a teacher class. So now we have a teacher class that extends the employee class. And we can continue to do this as many times as we want. We can extend from this teacher class to another class. Um, this is just a demonstration to show you how it works. So now we've passed in this salary for this teacher class. 
So now we're going to pass in the name, the age, and the job, and also a salary. So we call this super name, age, job. It's going to refer to this employee class. And it's going to call this constructor here name, age, and job. And it's going to set the values by calling the constructor from the person class and then setting the job here. So in the teacher class, we also add this salary that we want to set. And then we have getters once again and another main class to demonstrate it all. Let's run this. And as we can see, now it extended the output. It says John is a 40 year old teacher that makes $38,000 per year. So there's one thing that I, um, that I wanted you guys to notice. And that is every time we run these classes, we have um, a different output at the beginning. So when we ran the teacher class, it has teacher. When we ran employee class, it said employee class. When we ran the person class, it said person class before the output. So the reason this happens is because of a concept called polymorphism. Polymorphism is just a way to add functionality to a class depending on its um, data type. So these classes are all linked together by um, a hierarchy, a class hierarchy. And this class hierarchy is that the person class is the super class. And then we have an employee class that is a subclass of this person class. And then we have a teacher class that is a subclass of this employee class. So they are all bound together by these constraints. And polymorphism uses this hierarchy to know which method to call. So in our case, we're using the get name method. So let's check out the get name method for teacher. So in this get name method, we're calling teacher class plus name. So that's what's getting returned from this method. If we go up to the employee class, we see that it also has a get name method. It doesn't take any parameters and it returns employee class plus name. And similarly, if we go up to the person class, we have a get name method that says person class plus name. So the way the language knows how which method to call is it uses this hierarchy structure. So basically, it will start at this subclass. So whatever subclass that you're using to call the method, it's going to start there and it's going to look for the method that you're trying to call. And then it's going to try if that method does not exist in this a subclass, then it's going to go up to the next subclass and then it's going to look for that method there. If it's not there, then it's going to keep going up one by one through subclasses until it reaches the superclass. And if the superclass does not have the method, then it's just going to throw an error. So in our case, we have the teacher class and then we're calling the get name method. And it's like, okay, get name does, does exist in this teacher class. So we're going to um, call this get name method from the teacher class. However, if we did not have a get name method in the teacher class, it would go up to the employee class, uh, which is the uh, parent class of this teacher class, and it's going to check to see if the get name method is there. If it is, then it'll call the employee's get name method. If it isn't, then it's going to go up once again to the our person class and call the get name method from the person class. And if it doesn't exist in the person class, then it's just going to throw an error because the person class is the highest um, super class in this hierarchy. So let's take a look um, at how this this will work. So as we saw before, we're just going to run the teacher um, class again. And as we can see, it says teacher class because it's calling the teacher class get name. So if we remove this teacher class get name, save and run again, we'll see that it's going to go up and get the employee class get name method. So that is the way it's working. So we see that teacher extends employee. So it went up to the employee class and it got the get name from this employee class. So let's say we remove the get name from the employee class. And then we go back to teacher and run this teacher class again. As we can see, it went up to the person class and got the person class get name method. Even though the rest of the output is the same, it's calling the get name from the person class now. 
So let's go up to the person class and delete the get name method from here. Once we do this, we see these three classes now have a red mark. So the teacher get name method doesn't exist because the parent classes don't have a get name method either. And similarly for employee, there's no method. Also person as well, because now there's no get name method for person either. So this is how polymorphism works. And this is how it works in conjunction with constructors. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about are the initialization blocks. So an initialization block is just a block where you can um, set up your initial values for the fields in your class. So in this case, we have two fields. We have a static int i and an integer j. So we have two types of initialization blocks. You have the static block and then just a regular initialization block. Inside of a static block, which is denoted here by static and then the open and closing um, curly braces, we can put, we can um, set values for any static field that is in our class. So we set the I because it is a static I. So if we try to set the J value here, we could not because it is not a static field. You only can set static fields in the static initialization block. If you want to set regular um, non-static fields, then you can set it in the regular initialization, initialization block. And this is denoted just by curly braces. So here we can set the J and we can also set non-static fields in this um, initialization block as well. So we set the I to 20. So that is the difference here. There's also a difference in the way that these blocks run. So um, when these blocks are called, they're called before the constructor of the class is called. So we have a constructor down here and this constructor will run after these two initialization blocks. So the way that this works is the static block is always called first. It's called first and it's only called once. So when the static block um, runs, it'll run first and one time because the static block is called when the class is being um, initialized. So the uh, when the class is being initialized, the static block will be called. And then the regular initialization block is copied to each constructor and it is called before that constructor. So it's called as many times as the constructor is called and it's called um, um, before that constructor's content runs. So we're going to go ahead and run this and see how the order of the callings work. So let's save this and run it. All right, as we can see, the static block was called first, and then we set the field to the I, static I field to five. And then we call the initialization block when the constructor was called. So it was run first, and then the static field was set to 20. So that's just proof that we can set the static field inside of the initialization block, but we cannot set the um, non-static fields inside of the static block. All right, and then the constructor was called. And then also similarly for the second time we called the um, constructor, then the um, initialization block was called and then the constructor was called again. So the initialization, the regular initialization block is called each time the constructor is called. And the static block is only called one time at the beginning uh, when the class is first initialized. So that is how the initialization blocks work and also how constructors work. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, then smash the like button and subscribe to the channel because we have some really cool stuff coming up.